This is a crusade. This is a holy war against the deep state. Where are the dictators? Where are the strong men? Donald Trump is our instrument for retribution. I'm going to fight for Christians. I'm going to fight for white people. They have the great reset. We have the great awakening. And why shouldn't I root for Russia? Because Which I am. I want to see these people go through misery because of their grooming against our children. After the assailant entered the home asking, where's Nancy? Where's Nancy? Those are the very same words used by the mob when they stormed the United States Capitol. I did nothing wrong. Welcome to the Did Nothing Wrong podcast, where we cut through the noise and help you make sense of the chaotic information space around us. I'm Griff Somke. And I'm Jay McKenzie. A quick disclaimer before we get started. If you have any familiarity with our content, this shouldn't need to be said. But for the record, we at the Did Nothing Wrong podcast condemn all acts of political violence, as well as jokes about acts of political violence, and yes, that includes joke tweets. We look forward to similar condemnations from Haya Rychik, Matt Walsh, and Andy No. Thank you, and enjoy the program. Goad Gatsby is a writer and activist from Richmond, Virginia. He's known for being on the front lines whenever fascists show up, as well as his incredible sartorial choices and his disco mustache. He's doing vital and important work, and we're glad to have him with us today. Goad, welcome to Did Nothing Wrong. Glad to have you here today. I'm so sorry you had to have me here today. <laughs> no way. This is going to be awesome. So tell me a little bit about yourself and what exactly it is that you do. So I'm from Richmond, Virginia. I follow Virginia politics. I also follow far-right extremists, and I try to get somewhat confrontational with their ideology, going all the way back to the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. Yeah, you were you were right in the middle of all of that, weren't you? You got pepper sprayed by crying Nazi guy at one point. Yes, he likes to pretend that didn't happen and that I lied, but no, that's <laughs> exactly what happened. It was on video. Mm, yes, and uh, was that among the many reasons that guy ended up going to jail? For a while it was, and then he found a new way to get to jail. <laughs> <laughs> that guy just loves jail. He can't stay out of it. It's pretty impressive. You actually go back a little farther than Unite the Right. You first kind of came to prominence doing some protests against a group that called themselves the Virginia Flaggers. Why? You you had this really awesome routine. For those of you guys who don't know, and please feel free to correct me on this if I'm wrong here, the Virginia Flaggers were a group who were one of those quote-unquote heritage, not hate people that like to stand on a street corner in Richmond and hold up the Confederate flag for people to you know, react to one way or the other. And you decided this wasn't cool, so how'd you handle that? By what any sane, rational person would do, and that would be get a boombox and play loud rap music. Yes, that's an excellent idea. That's an absolutely <laughs> excellent idea. And what what do they think of that? People who hold up the Confederate flag, they're all big fans of hip hop, right? Well, it, it actually, it's funny you say that. Here we are in whatever year it is now. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, the album uh, Yeezus just came out. And I really liked <laughs> playing the song New Slaves. I thought, I thought that was silly. But man, time has made a fool out of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all those guys are probably really down with Kanye West now. It's just... Uh... Now, now they're saying I always like Kanye. <laughs> Some people in that group were also members of a little group called League of the South. Oh, yeah. A little, little heritage, not hate group going there, huh? Uh, absolutely. They're not racist. They just want their own separate ethno state for whites only in the Southeast United States. Right. Not racist. Right. Oh, also no Jews allowed. Right. Right. Of course, because, you know, they they're they're not racist at all. There's nothing nothing racist about any of this. That's just heritage, not hate. And you're projecting if that's what you think. As Jefferson Davis did nothing wrong. Is that one of their one of their slogans <laughs> <laughs> at this point? I, I will say one of their worst slogans that goes beyond Jefferson Davis did nothing wrong. And it was Lee surrendered. I didn't. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's almost like Nathan Bedford Forrest did nothing wrong territory there. We're getting getting really close to yeah. Well, I, I want to ask, since you brought him up, one of the things I noticed, and you've probably seen this, the, the Prager U kids videos that are going out there, 
that are now being taught in schools and, and red states are approving this and allowing this to go in the classroom. And one of the th one of the videos that they have is about Appomattox and Lee surrendering. And it essentially just has Lee and Grant at a table saying, we, we fought together and we are friends and we just happen to be on different sides in this, but we're both Americans. And I'm sure you've seen plenty of this that is just this constant whitewashing and it's i'm in tennessee i saw it as a kid going to school and it's this idea that maybe slavery had something to do with the civil war but there were there were a lot of reasons and and they don't want to have that discussion just just come out and say it that the reason the south seceded is because they wanted slaves uh -huh. Uh -huh. i mean i i'm absolutely on board but to these lost causers, heritage, not hate crowd, uh, they would absolutely disagree with the content of those PragerU videos and would say that uh, the people that they were surrendering to were enacting like terroristic violence against them by, by responding to their revolution, their armed insurrection with their own show of military force. And so <laughs> I would say like that within like a right wing circle is a compromise. Uh -huh. Because like other PragerU videos has gone out and said that like the war was about slavery. I would sure like to see that in kids form, but it's probably not going to. Right. But like this was also like because <laughs> one, it was very poorly researched, but that was just how PragerU does things. And so like <laughs> uh, when when that came out, the, uh, the those same Virginia flaggers were very upset with uh, with PragerU. Yeah, no of kidding. Course. <laughs> this civil case which was filed in 2020 was um to me my me not giving up in in just really wanting to stand up for press freedom in portland stand up for myself and also, also to send a message that what happened to me was wrong in that we can unmask some of these um, persons of interest or suspects. And so the, the verdict delivery um, this earlier this week was um, extremely disappointing. So a guy named Andy No said again that you are the leader of Antifa in Richmond, Virginia. And I was just wondering... How did you get that job? Well, I don't I don't know. I guess I was appointed when I wasn't looking because I did not accept that. <laughs> My pet theory is the reason they think this is because that's how they work. And if you look at a right wing organization, three members, all three of them will have a title. They are very yeah, hierarchical yeah. and top down. And so for them, that's what it must be. They look at something like a protest in the street and they assume someone organized it, someone planned it, someone put it together. These people all have titles. It's very structured. And if you've ever spent any time around leftists, that's just generally not how that works. But they haven't, so they don't understand that it's a little more spontaneous than that a lot of the time. But they have to put their own structure on it, and that's kind of where they probably get a lot of that. And I think that's about as charitable and good faith as I can possibly be about it. It's either that or they're just completely lying, one or the other. Uh, I, I got to say, like, there is nothing in anti-fascism that is like the Proud Boys, where there is literally a chairman. There is yeah. literally, like, elders. Like, that's, what they, that's what they think I am, because all of their elders are just, the, or had been, now they're, a lot of them are serving lengthy prison sentences. Mm. But, like, womp, womp. Th their elders are the most famous Proud Boys. So I'm I'm the most famous person in left wing street action. So I must be the one in charge there because that's how they would that's how they would decide who's in charge. Mm -hmm. And they just they look at that and they think, oh, well, they must be just like us, except, you know, they disagree with us on everything. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's worth pointing out and, and saying, like you're talking about, that they think the left is a mirror of them. Or if if that mirror doesn't exist, they create it. But there there is a distinct difference between being an anti-fascist activist and being a part of this shadowy Antifa organization, which is mostly just a creation in their imagination. Yeah, definitely. So 
Let's talk a little about Andy No. He was in Richmond for a presentation. Correction. He was in Henrico County. Henrico County. <laughs> he planned to be in Richmond. Is that correct? Uh-huh. At one point, yes. Tried to go to Richmond. Couldn't quite make that one happen. So he ended up in Henrico County because, like all well-meaning people, Richmond didn't especially want him. He couldn't find a venue. So he ends up outside of Richmond. And he was doing a presentation that, what what was the point of all of this? I'm not quite clear what he was trying to accomplish being out there. What was his, what was his goal? You know, I got to say there's two things that they could have been trying to do. Uh, the first, the most obvious one is that they would just have a conference where they give out their ideas. But I think most likely the second thing would be they want to have a protest against them for the visual effect. They want to be the victim. Right. And I'm on the fence that it's the second thing hmm. because I looked at some of the footage of what was going on there. Why would, why would they pick a downtown location that was close to the VCU campus, the Virginia Commonwealth campus where a lot of the protests were happening. Right. And I feel that uh, they just wanted a central location so they could have protesters to come at them. Oh, also there was a giant hurricane like coming through, like hurricane Ophelia was coming through right. Richmond at that time. So it, definitely did not mobilize a lot of people. Huh. So basically it looked like maybe it was a media stunt that they were hopefully going to get some, some protesters, some people showing up and they could film all of that and talk about how Andy's narrative is so dangerous. They, they can't allow him to speak. The left has to shut him down. By by the way, the the magazine that I worked for the publication, uh, RVA mag, Got an email from uh, after we ran a story saying that he was going to be in there. They sent an email saying that, no, we, we had canceled on him because the organizers were deceptive about who was speaking. So once we found out who it was, we canceled on them. Now, this is according to an email that they sent to me. Now, Fox News Digital, uh, the same organizers claim a different story. Right. So believe whatever you want to believe. <laughs> But but one way or the other, they they end up uh, blaming you or or pushing it in your direction. It seems to me that you are this boogeyman for them because you keep showing up and you show your face, and that's about the extent of it. Is there is there anything else? <laughs> well, the, their argument against me is similar to the complaints against say libs of TikTok where I would say Andy No is having an event at this location. You know, I'm doing this because like they've already publicly stated somewhere and I'm then elevating that to people who would follow me. So they are claiming that the people that I would, that would follow me would go out and attack them. Huh? Now that's not what happened, but for libs of TikTok, like people do call in bomb threats. The people that like watch libs of TikTok videos and find out that Children's Hospital also do, like, gender... They do gender-affirming surgery. Yeah, but yeah, Yeah. they do that, and then they call it a bomb threat. And it's like clockwork with libs of TikTok. Anytime they mention anything, it seems like within a day or two, that organization is seeing bomb threats. That organization is seeing threatening phone calls. And if you look at the comments on their Twitter feed, you'll see why. Because the people are just absolutely unhinged. And as a joke... I don't write stochastic terrorists as my bio. Yeah. That's sort of the difference between me and them. Right. Well, and I don't have a hard time believing that if something like this did happen indirectly as a result of anything you're doing, I'm sure you would condemn it. I'm sure you would call out and say, don't do this. This is not who we are. This is not what we do. And libs of TikTok does not, no matter how many times this keeps happening. And it's over a dozen at this point. There is no condemnation. There is no, we should be better than this. It's just, oh, that's not my fault. And on to the next. Yep. They can't admit that they might have any culpability here. They can't admit that it's the people that listen to their stuff. And it's the people that read their content that are doing this. There's no separation whatsoever. They know what's going to happen now when they post something online. They know that their fan base is going to go after whoever it is they just targeted and it's targeting call it what it is. They they're targeting people now. And in my case, like the worst 
the the worst thing that happened where people called the venue and said, I disagree with the speaker you've chosen to have in your venue. Gosh. And at that point, it's up to the venue to make that decision. So that's, hey, baby, that's free market capitalism. Mm -hmm. Sounds like free speech to me. Yeah. I hope they were fans of that. Yeah. It's hard for them to understand that anybody choosing voluntarily not to want to associate with them or not to want to purchase their content or you know, spend money on their ideas is somehow suppressing their free speech. It's like you don't have a right to an audience. You just have a right to say it. And people have a right to react to that, however they react. And if it's walking away from it and saying, no, I don't think you, I don't think you need to be associated with us. They, they really can't handle that. It's just, it's crazy. Well, and, and some of this seems like when we're dealing with someone such as Andy, no, there's a big disconnect between how popular he is online and how popular he tends to be at any given place. Uh, it seems like it is, it is easy to cultivate that audience on the internet when you never have to leave your home, but in real life, yeah. it, it doesn't seem like he's got this big band of supporters. Am I, am I wrong? Well, based off of the attendance, it looked like maybe 40 people showed up. He claimed hundreds. I, I can tell you that they didn't, even the most generous way that that did not reach above 99 people. <laughs> but, you know, the people that do support him are of positions of power. Mm. I've noted that former ICE director Tony Pham was there. There's a couple people that uh, I can't confirm their identity, so I don't want to be wrong on this. But I, maybe somebody who was big at Regent University. I don't know if you've ever heard of Regent oh, University. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, State Senator Amanda Chase was there as well. Uh, I don't know, she was also with Stuart Rhodes shooting a video on January 5th. So, huh. yeah, weird. Weird how that worked out. Gosh, weird, weird. But, yeah, and, you know, seems to be a person that is pushed onto these large audiences and told that uh, we're supposed to enjoy, uh, you know, the algorithm here on the X.com <laughs> seems to love pushing out his content. I mean, growing up, there was a little newspaper called gotcha. I don't know if you've ever heard it or, or something similar like this, where it would just print out the mug shots of people who had been arrested locally Huh. He's turned that into an online sensation, but like an international online sensation where you take like these compromising pictures of people. Uh, you know, if you've ever been arrested, it is terrible being arrested. And they have the photo at the end. They beat you. Like, they don't literally beat you down, but like it's, it's an emotional beat down to be like put in handcuffs, taken to a jail, read what your rights are. And like uh, strip naked, and then they take your picture. Yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna look terrible. Yeah, and like this is just a, a collection of all these people in the worst moments of their life. And in Andy No's case, he was showing pictures of people from Richmond who had been arrested. One of them was the student body president of VCU at the time, Taylor Baloney. Uh, and like they, they were arrested along with me. And like our crime was being in a park after sunset. Except when we were arrested, we weren't in that park. <laughs> so, you know, all of our charges, all of our charges were dropped. But to Andy, no, he saw that as the prosecutors and the politicians are siding with the Antifa in their quest <laughs> to be in parks after sunset. So what you're telling me is it didn't even make a whole lot of sense what they were trying to push, that it was one of those Andy has a narrative and he's not going to let the facts get in the way of anything he's out there selling at this point. Absolutely. The shadowy cabal is definitely doing something. I guess the details aren't always in, important, but yeah, why why is there such a need for Andy on the right? Jeez, I don't I, I feel like he's supposed to be like their big research guy, like all the intel comes from him. And the reason why, you know, he doesn't get wiped out from all these social media sites is that he always sort of because he went to school for journalism. Like he, he could make good stuff if he wanted, but he knows how to write in sort of like a neutral language, but that will also like excite his crowd. He's smart enough to, to do things in a way that will, would cause the most amount of attention. Right. And that's sort of his existence is that he's sort of, what's that show? 
entertainment tonight for the wacky right wingers uh <laughs> right that actually makes a whole lot of sense you watch the andy no show and he tells you about all of these things that are supposedly happening and you're getting all of this from one guy who's a bit of a fabulist and makes things up routinely when he needs to and boy that actually explains a lot andy no as entertainment tonight <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because it seems like he's got inflammatory tweets all the time. Everything is the end of the world. And he's got videos that he puts out that never quite seem to line up with the things that he's saying that they are. And we recently saw a court case that he had in Portland, Oregon, where he had sued several activists for supposedly hitting him with a milkshake and beating him up. And he won a default judgment against three people he sued who didn't show up for court. But when it came to the actual people who bothered to show up and defend themselves, the whole thing was thrown out. Did you follow that at all? I wasn't closely following it, but I do know what you're talking about. He had gone all the way through it, and there wasn't really anything conclusive that he could comment on really that was going on. He ended up getting the whole thing thrown out. He didn't like some of the people who were invited to give testimony. He had a real issue with um, a gentleman named Alexander Reed Ross being one of the witnesses. He didn't like that at all. He um, wasn't really able to prove anything beyond someone hit him because that was on video, but he couldn't really say who it was. And there were three people who didn't bother to show up to defend themselves. So they ended up with a, a default judgment out of it. But as far as the people who actually showed up, no, everybody walked. It was definitely not Andy Noe's best day for that. So what I what I found really interesting about that case is because there, there are things like uh, the Signs v. Kessler lawsuit where it was, you know, victims that were attacked in right. Charlottesville in 2017. There's the uh, Alex Jones Sandy Hook. There's the Dominion defamation cases. And that like a lot of these cases win because one on merit but two in just sort of how the defendants just have an absolutely lackluster performance is that they continue to dig themselves as the litigation is going on and this is one where it was the plaintiffs that were digging themselves in deeper as the litigation went on and so like yeah everybody that like took it seriously like were able to get either Mm -hmm. uh had a there were also people who had a settlement that uh, avoided the trial entirely. And, you know, those were undisclosed, but I don't imagine that that settlement was anything other than a hearty handshake. Yeah. But to the people that like did did go to court, like they kind of exposed just how bad that lawsuit was, how flimsy it was. And I, I guess Andy No should be considered lucky. One is that the judge said, okay, like I'll keep the default for these people that didn't show up, but also like didn't get held liable for the, the defendant's legal legal fees because of how bad that suit was. He definitely has a thing for looking for a way to be the victim in these situations. He is, you know, definitely looking for that sort of sympathy from his people that are his audience. All right. So Goad, I've got to ask you this because I know you've dealt with it in the moment in real time. If you see, someone like Andy No or Andy No himself and you are a left winger if you are on the opposite side of him what do you do and what do you do not do well first of all i would say you would never do a crime do not do a crime quote me on this one <laughs> i'm encouraging people to not do a crime but second of all the, what you should be doing here is you should be getting out your phone you should be asking him uncomfortable questions. You should be making him feel unwelcomed in ways that are legal. Right. He does have a victim complex, but when you don't make him the victim, but instead, you know, you try to, you know, just ask him some normal questions and he freaks out, then hopefully you can flip this around him because a lot of the audience that he cultivates thinks that the people around him can't control themselves in a civil society right? and that he's, he's going to take like whatever type of video and any type of context he has in order to, to introduce that idea. And so, you know, he found a video of me seven years ago where a neo-Nazi supporter behind a camera 
starts to to film me and I get angry at him and I tell that guy to fuck off, he then makes that video or takes that same video and publishes and that that's that's who I am. By the way, that was from seven years ago. Thanks for saying I still look that young. <laughs> Well, you, you said that the person filming was a neo-Nazi. He was one of the Virginia flaggers <laughs> with a little League of South background and uh, friends with Matthew Heimbach back in those days. Ooh, mm. Matthew Heimbach. <laughs> yeah. Could you imagine 2014 Matthew Heimbach? I've seen pictures. Are we talking like pre like goatee and mustache Matthew Heimbach? Yeah, we're talking White Student Union in Towson University, Matthew Heimbach. <laughs> that Matthew Heimbach. He had he had a look to him back then. It's maybe something he should consider bringing back for his next, like, not really a Nazi, actually a communist organization he decides he wants to try and start, Oh, which I'm sure is coming sometime next week. By the way, I did run into old Jaime back in D.C. at the uh, the fake anti-war rally. Uh, How is he? Uh terrible he won't admit it but he is doing terrible oh yeah this this stuff ages you really really poorly hate does not really do well with your skin and just everything it's it's a mess yeah yeah it definitely is and these guys just have a shelf life it seems after a while we talked a little bit earlier about you know crying nazi chris cantwell this is a guy that in 2017 was the big bad for a few minutes and now he's inmate number whatever it is in federal prison from the sounds of things oh no he's out, he's out now. oh he's out now he's out now yeah, he's out he's posting again yeah he's posting about me <laughs> oh just can't let it go can he just can't but you, you know what like that was six years ago. Hopefully I've moved on to other things. He's still reliving that moment. Mm -hmm. Probably because it's as relevant as he'll ever be, you know? That was kind of his big moment right there. And, you know, it's that or go back to running a libertarian talk show. Very interesting new reporting on efforts to shake up the Republican presidential race following Wednesday's debate, which once again did not feature former President Trump. Some of the country's biggest GOP donors want to bring in a new contender into the campaign. Robert Costa was first to report on all this, and he joins us now. Bob, good morning. What's going on? Good morning, Tony. Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin, a Republican, is being recruited to make a late entry now into the 2024 Republican presidential race. He's being recruited by billionaires like Thomas Perfetti and by former Attorney General Bill Barr and many others who will be convening in Virginia Beach in mid-October for what's being called a Red Vest Retreat, a named after the fleece Youngkin wore in his 2021 gubernatorial campaign. They see him as someone who could maybe take on former President Donald Trump as Trump remains the front runner in the race. But there's a lot of skepticism too about whether this is possible with all of the looming ballot deadlines and Trump's dominance. So let's talk a little bit about your, your in Richmond, your, your current governor, gentleman by the name of Glenn Youngkin. He's uh, definitely a central figure of Virginia Republicans. Do you think this guy's got a future nationally? Uh, maybe not in this cycle. But I do think, like, long-term, yeah, he does have national aspirations. Uh, I think, uh, well, I'm speculating that uh, if the upcoming election, like, midterm elections for Virginia politics, like, uh, it's big wins for, like, the Republicans in the state legislature that he will, like, pivot to that. But he is getting all, a lot of money coming in from out of the state for these, like, state Senate runs that, that are being funded as well as getting is really sucking up like the Ron DeSantos support because like right. as, as his backers are leaving, like uh, one person, Thomas Peterfree uh, gave him, has given him $2 million this year just from one person. Uh, and he's a former DeSantis backer. So yeah, I do think that if not in this cycle that he very well could uh, do that again in the future. But I definitely think he, he could also be running for vice president if uh, the Republicans do not nominate Trump. Right. Yeah. I've still seen some chatter off and on about various Republican donors or political operatives who are still trying to get Youngkin to jump in the race because they see that DeSantis is kind of over. So, yeah, it may not be now, but I think you're right that it's coming. And you 
I noticed that you shared a, a byline with a guest we've had on, Stephen Monticelli, talking about a, a $1 million investment to Yunkin from an Austin area billionaire. Do you want to talk about that a little bit and tell us what, what's going on here and why is someone in Texas giving a million dollars to the governor of Virginia? Oh, uh, well, one thing that Yunkin is really gung-ho about is privatizing education. He would say this in different ways, but at the end of the day, it comes down to coming up with free market solutions for education that would usurp uh, traditional public education and a lot of the front group that had created an LLC to do that seems to be tied in with that education privatization. And uh, I would also say that a, another person uh, from Texas was a big donor as well, maybe not at the million dollar level, but uh, his name has escaped me and I wasn't prepared for this, but he was the, uh, he's, he's the founder of a Bud Light distributing company or Budweiser distributing company. Uh, he based out of Texas, and he just got an appointment to, I believe, the UVA Board of Visitors. So, yeah, he, he's using his position, probably not in the way that, like, that uh, DeSantis does, where he's uh, having his own uh, ideology, but instead he's trying to get people that have been loyal to him, like, really good government jobs, uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. you know, positions of power, appointments, what have you. And so, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think it's very likely that people are just trying to buy their way in on the ground floor of, you know, someone who is a rising star in the Republican Party. That is interesting, because I think you mentioned in the article that a little bit before that donation, which it may or may not be related, but Youngkin also sent some troops to the border to help with what the Republicans are calling an invasion. So it, there's a lot going on here, whereas I think you have spent several years covering politics on a on a local level and following it in your state and what's happening. But it also seems like politics has become national. You know, the, the saying used to be, well, politics is local, but in, in a lot of ways, it's it's all become national. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, especially, I don't know if you've heard this in the news, but Susanna Gibson is running for uh, House of Delegates, 57 of 100, and her seat is getting national attention. How much national attention? She was in the Washington Post because somebody found her, her Chatterbait account, and that became the national news. Not not her policies, right. but, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's how things are working right now in Virginia is that because Virginia has off-year elections that don't match up with any other state except for, I think, New Jersey, that the attention is trying to make Virginia the battleground for the next year. And, you know, this is something I live with every four years, is that all of these uh, national groups are going to use Virginia as their practice run. And so because of that, there's just people from not around here trying to, to get their way. Right. Outsized amounts of media attention and all the national folks dropping in. Yeah. I don't envy you that. Yeah. I also do not envy Iowa waitresses for that same reason. <sighs> yeah. No kidding. See, I'm out here in Washington state. I live in the Seattle area and like we are so irrelevant when it comes to national elections. It's not even funny. Nobody cares. We know which way it's going to go and it's going to be laughable. So we're kind of jealous in a way, but then when you hear these stories, you're kind of like, eh, I don't know. Do we really want that? I personally like the idea of like pulling two states at random every four years. I mean, some, some years you could end up with like Alaska and Iowa, or you could end up with, you know, Nevada and Virginia and just make them really be on their game from the beginning. If you do that, they're going to gerrymander all these states. I mean, that's that's why the Electoral College is as stupid as it is right now. Why did why do we need two Dakotas <laughs> so they could have four senators in 1870, whatever? So <laughs> it really needs an overhaul in a lot of ways. There's really a lot of ways we could do this better. And, you know, there's any number of good ideas out there. And the idea that like Wyoming and South Dakota, North Dakota really need two senators. 
That that is why you see somebody like Charlie Kirk going out there and saying, "Oh, democracy is bad," and he, of course, tries to differentiate between the constitutional republic and a democracy. And and part of what they're reminding their audience of is that, no, 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 we can't get rid of the electoral college because Republicans, as it stands now, would would lose every election and have no control of the House or the Senate. So yes. Vote by the people is 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 bad on this national level. And uh, it's something they just keep hammering home because it's they're just not that popular in reality. We are finding out more tonight about the arrest of 31 members of a white supremacist group allegedly plotting to riot at a pride event up in Idaho. They were discovered Saturday, packed into the back of a U-Haul truck, all wearing similar clothing and white face coverings. Police were tipped off by somebody who saw these guys loading masks and shields into a truck and told the police that they looked like a little army. The men are reportedly members of the Patriot Front. This is a white nationalist group, and we're, we're heading to an LGBTQ pride event to riot. I will tell you, it, it appeared to be very similar to an operations plan that a police or military group would uh, put together for a days of, uh, for an event. Uh, there was at least one smoke grenade. Um, there was multiple shields. Uh, they were all wearing hats that had um, uh, plastic inside them, um, shin guards, shields, things of that nature. And they weren't local. The suspects came from at least 11 different states. They're all facing misdemeanor charges for a conspiracy to riot. But the FBI is now involved in the investigation as well. So you've written about how there's a lot of folks on the more mainstream side of the right that are constantly trying to label groups like Patriot Front as feds, even though they mostly believe all the same things at this point as a lot of the mainstream Republicans do. And Patriot Front's just a little more upfront about how they feel about it. So do you think inc incidents like what happened in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, where a whole bunch of these idiots got doxxed and charged with conspiracy to riot are going to change anyone's mind, or are they just going to keep being dishonest about it? Oh, absolutely. They're going to be dishonest until, like, I think there was uh, two people from a church from where or from your neck of the woods uh, in, in eastern Washington right. that, uh, like, the they were members there, mm -hmm. and, like, the... The, the pastor said that they that they were all fake. Like, yeah. you're saying this about your own members. It's a good old Roger Stone tactic. Like, they will deny it until it is impossible to deny, or they find a better way to deny it. Right. They're going to find ways to say that Patriot Front is actually left-wing as well. But right now, the easiest one is just to say that it's an FBI operation created. <laughs> and there was, there was one thing I just briefly touched on in, in uh, the video that I, I made on YouTube is that if you want to say that the federal government is creating groups like Patriot Front, and, and you know, there, there is a definite history of like the federal government, especially actually, I think there was one case with within one Patriot Front member where they are given like a siphon as a criminal informant. And what they are doing with that money is that they are targeting left wing actions, you know, whether it be a drag event in Idaho whether it be, uh, you know, something in Washington or Boston or something like that, if that is a, a federal operation that is created by the government, then they are directly attacking left-wing organizations. But that is, a, that is an uncomfortable truth that they, will ha they can't have. And, you know, and right now, like, there is lawsuits against Patriot Front. There's one here in Richmond uh, for defacing a mural. There's one in Boston. And even Patriot Front members are suing the people that are, yeah. that are doxing them. So, that was amazing. <laughs> you know, you have these very real legal cases, and you're saying, like, well, it's all fake. It can't be real. And look, <laughs> I've, I've been hitting over the head with a tiki torch. That shit is real. <laughs> Everybody just wants to sit around and wait and think that these groups can't touch them. It's going to be very sad to sort of the, the moderate types that think that these groups will never come for them. Right. But uh, I also I also want to say Lincoln Project, I fucking hate you forever. Your little stunt in Charlottesville with the fake tiki torches is the ammunition that will be used 
for at least 10 more years as to why all groups are fake, even though like that one was on the same day, like the like Lincoln Project took credit for it. I don't know who was actually fooled by that, but like, you, you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they yeah. had the political operatives show up dressed as Unite the Right rally attendees. And yeah, that was a stupid idea. Yeah, they had tiki torches that, and it was pouring rain. That was a really, really stupid idea. You're right. That was not a smart move on their part. And it's done nothing but harm, I think. I, I think the thing is that they're going to do what they're going to do. The right is going to say what they're going to say, and you can't stop that. But do not give them fuel. Do not make it easier for them. Do not make it more appealing, more believable to their audience, because that is what they are constantly searching for. Yeah. And they, they scour the internet for this. They scour all the news sites. They're constantly looking for one guy somewhere who posted something that fits their narrative yeah. and they're going to find it because that's just the way the world is at this point, but don't give them a made for TV media opportunity. Yeah. Don't punch Andy no in the face mm -hmm. because it's after that event, even uh, as dishonest as the, supposed so-called concrete milkshake narrative was well afterwards where, where did he go well he went on joe rogan and that was a huge huge win for him and a huge platform mm -hmm. and don't help these people because going back a little bit to andy no there is this disconnect between the jobs he can hold down and how often he's he's cited as an expert he couldn't keep his job at colette that lasted for a very short amount of time. He's been at the Post Millennial, which is really just kind of a junk news site. But he's also going on Joe Rogan and he's going on Temple Show and he's being cited by Fox News. He's everywhere. Yeah. And none of those people are going to ask him about the cider riot where he embedded himself in with Patriot Prayer. Mm -hmm. And someone from Patriot Prayer gave somebody a severe spinal injury. And the next day, having the knowledge that he knew that, that one of those guys were, were the perpetrators, he then decided to come up with the, the victim's criminal history. So, like, and, and then later a video came out that he was listening into their conversations as they were planning the attack. So, like, he won't go on a show that will ask him a question of, like, why are you around Patriot Prayer members in, in 2019 during this attack and then like running cover for them. He, he's never going to step on that rake, so to speak. Right. Of putting himself into that, that position. And when you asked me earlier, like what you should do uh, if you're ever around Andy No, is that you should ask him those questions that people like Joe Rogan or Tim Poole will never ask him. Peter Brimlow's daughter <laughs> will always happily use Andy No for whatever political points that he can score right right and they know their audience they know their narrative and they're going to push that as hard as they can and you know andy no is always more than willing to to be that guy to be their their serious researcher the guy that they can use to do the whole oh it's actually the left that's completely racist not us and that's great for them but we got to stop giving them that ammunition well, and if you look back, you mentioned this recent event in Richmond, and you've got the former acting director of ICE, Tony Pham, there. And we know that the Trump administration tried to label Antifa as a domestic terrorist threat. Whatever your personal thoughts on Andy No, the things that he says and, and does can actually lead to policy in Republican administrations. So this isn't just sort of ephemeral and bullshit out in the air. It is to an extent, but it can also become more than that. And we need to make sure that we don't help him in that. Yeah, and not to sound like, watch out for the deep state, but like the Homeland Security Department is still like very much like right leaning, mm -hmm. like in terms of like, of like small hiring. And it's not something that Joe Biden like actually like wants to go to bat to like wipe, uh, wipe out like the right wing ideologues working in DHS. I mean, there was a similar story where the Department of Homeland Security was caught like copying an Andy No headline. So thanks, Ken Kleppenstein, for, for busting up that one. But like that's that's just uh, how it is. Like he's very influential on policies. But there have been people 
that have protests against Andy No doing legal actions, worrying about retaliation. Like, if you are afraid to go on the sidewalk outside of an Andy No event and just hold up a sign that's like, I don't like Andy No, then at that point, like, you're crushing your free speech, maybe not legally, but they are like in spirit of like your ability to to protest. Right. And, you know, part of Andy No's shtick is like, oh, I'm from Portland. Like, everybody's so militantly left wing, they'll attack you if you have a counter belief. No, they'll attack you if you're patriot prayer and you do street violence and they see you out in yeah. public. So that's where I stand, man. I look, I know, I know at the end of the episode, you're going to say, no, the people in this podcast did nothing wrong. And that's, <laughs> that's how you work, man. Maybe just this one time you could say something different. <laughs> we, we, we can do that. We yeah, do we that. can do that. That's, that's fixable. No problem. <laughs> yeah. And to some extent, the whole name comes from their, their over usage of that term. but. At the same time, it's like they're going to tell you they did nothing wrong because in their mind they never did. You know, just until the cows come home. That's this is how they see it. Everything they do is for the greater good of their cause. So how could it possibly be wrong, right? They're trying yeah. to achieve, in some cases, an ethno state. In some cases, you know, a fascist takeover of the United States government, and they think these are all good things. So to them, it's like, well, of course. Or in Andy Noe's case, his reply guys go out and do a mass shooting. Mm -hmm. multiple, multiple reply guys. Yeah, you would think that the guy would show a little self-awareness after maybe, I don't know, the second one. That, hey, maybe these guys all have one thing in common and it's me. Maybe I should rethink my life choices, but unfortunately. What else is he going to do? Yeah, yeah. He's pretty unemployable at this point other than that. Like you said, he's kind of stuck in this career path and as a result he's going to do what he's going to do so how can people support you and the work you're doing well you can go to Goad gatsby uh on twitter uh also on patreon and i also have a Substack. it's just goad.substack.com oh also there's one more there's a new thing it's called blue sky oh maybe in the future blue sky. maybe in the future we're, we're all on blue sky and not on twitter <laughs> crossing fingers here yeah. Check me out, Goat, on Blue Sky. Blue Sky is pretty cool. We are, we are on Blue Sky. We're not as active, I don't think, as we probably should be over there. But it's definitely a different vibe altogether on Blue Sky than it is on Twitter at this point in the game. I refuse yeah. to call it X. I just can. And uh, also, I do a little bit of writing. I'm on RVA Mag as well. Uh, and on the radio, yeah. a, a local community Richmond station, Monday nights at 11. Uh, w R I R. I don't know. Uh, and I don't know when you're going to put this out, but on Friday, I'm going to be at UVA for a, uh, a little journalism conference with my friend Molly Conger. This is Madeline Conger, better known by the moniker Molly. AKA Madeline. Madeline Conger. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Andy, for breaking that big story for us. We were just waiting for that. Cool. Well, hey, Goad, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us and talk about it for a while. We've been fans of your work for a while, and we're glad that you were able to do this. This is great. All right. Well, hopefully uh, when Andy No steps on a proverbial rake, you can have me back and we can laugh about it. Crossing our fingers. <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. Take care. Thanks. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks for listening to the Did Nothing Wrong podcast. If you want to hear more, you can find us on the web at didnothingwrongpod.com. Please make sure you subscribe to get our content straight into your inbox. You can also follow us on Twitter at James, the word for, and the letter M, all one word, and Grizza BJJ, G-R-Z-A-B-J-J, -J, as well as DNW Pod. We're extremely grateful for paid subscriptions and donations that allow us to keep doing this important work. Thanks, and remember, everyone mentioned did nothing wrong. Well, everyone except Andy No. <laughs> <laughs>